Hello, this is Paul Mlajenovic, and welcome to uh, my video. Okay, as you know, I'm with the RavenCapitalist.com, and I help people with their finances. But uh, hey, welcome. Now, up on the board, you see the phrase "counterparty risk," and this video is on counterparty risk. Now, I know you're probably looking at that, saying, "What the hell is that?" I mean, that sounds so weird. Yeah, you know I mean, what, what what does this have to do with me or my finances or the world at large? Everything. Counterparty risk is something you should be aware about. Now. If you're my client or student, you've heard me talk about this before. Some of you know I did a seminar on investing in commodities, and I talk in there about gold and silver, and I talk about counterparty risk. It's uh, You can probably find the commodities seminar over at ravencapitalist.com if you want to take a view at this. But let me talk about this now, because I think this is a very important topic. It's amazing to me how many financial planners don't know or are not aware of counterparty risk. And this is going to impact everybody. And if you're not if you're not aware of this, you are at great risk, especially in today's world. As a matter of fact, the last few years, you've seen the impact of counterparty risk, although you may not have viewed it through that prism. So what is counterparty risk? Well, counterparty risk is really the risk that comes in a paper asset because a paper asset, its value is tied directly to the promise or performance of a third party. Now, that sounds pretty murky. What does that mean? Well, understand this. Think about the investments that are out in, in the world today. There's two types of investments, right? There are paper investments and there's non-paper or tangible investments. What's a paper investment? Well, you're familiar with both of them. Stocks, bonds, you know, and other derivatives from this, like ETFs, mutual funds, etc. and so forth. And here's the point. Whenever you own stock, it's a paper investment, and this has value, but that value is tied to the company's performance, right? Why do you buy stock? Because you're presuming that the underlying company has value and will grow, and that'll make your stock rise in value, correct? So you see the counterparty risk. What happens if that company falls apart, has problems, goes into bankruptcy? What will happen to the value of your stock? That stock, if you have a certificate in your hand, doesn't seem to have changed, but its value has come down drastically. Why? Because of counterparty risk. So we see that. But how about bonds? Whenever you, you know, uh, have a bond or money in a bank, there's counterparty risk. In other words, what if the people who pay you, you know, uh, the, uh, the debtors, what if they don't perform? What if they don't pay? What if they uh, <laughs> leave town? You know, what happens? Your debt, that investment, becomes worthless. So the big problem with paper assets mortgages, derivatives, stocks, bonds, ETFs, and mutual funds, all of these things have counterparty risk. Now, counterparty risk was not that big of a deal 5 and 10 and 15 years ago. Standard conventional diversification would have helped out. But as you've seen since 2008 onward, you've seen the cracks in the system. Paper assets now have revealed their major flaw. So the point to you and I is, is that in terms of our portfolio, we should be aware about counterparty risk, and we should do what we can to mitigate it. This is why, some of you know, I wrote the book, Precious Metals Investing for Dummies. I think precious metals, like gold and silver, are a very important asset to hold, but to hold in physical bullion form. Why is it? Gold and silver are one of the few vehicles out there, investment vehicles, that do not have counterparty risk. See, when you own gold, it has its own value. The value of gold or silver, their value is not dependent on a third party's promise or performance in the same way as a, as a stock or a bond or other type of vehicle that's out there. So you start to see that. So the thing is, you might talk to a financial advisor and you say, oh, I'm worried about risk today. And what else a financial advisor say? Well, we should have diversified portfolio of stocks and diversified portfolio of bonds you know, diversified portfolio of mutual funds or some combination of the above. And they may be the greatest stock picker in the world, they may be the great, greatest bond picker in the world, but all these things still have counterparty risk. So for you and I, diversification in today's economy, and what's today, November 2011, or 2012 for that matter, the point is, is that we have to be diversified away from counterparty risk. Because there's different kinds of risk out there, right? There is, uh, you know, there's a risk from inflation, risk from bankruptcy of the company, credit risk, you know, all sorts of risks. Now, some people have told me, well, you know, Paul, I'm going to be avoiding risk in stocks and bonds. 
I will go into mutual funds. Sorry, but a mutual fund is only as good as what is in its portfolio. They have counterparty risk, and then they as a conduit activity means the counterparty risk comes back to you and you get hammered with the values involved. Other people have said, well, you know, Paul, I'm going to put my money in a bank account and avoid this so-called counterparty risk. Well, I hate to tell you, you're not avoiding counterparty risk there. Beside the fact that the bank itself could be solvent or insolvent, that's a separate issue. The other point is, remember, that currencies, money you have in your hand, whether that money is in dollars or anything else, whether it's in your hands or in your pocket or in a bank account, there is counterparty risk there. Why? Because that currency is reliant on how well that currency is managed by that government. If that government uh, expands tremendously the supply of that currency... What does it mean? That bodes ill for what you own. In other words, if I own dollars, but they're printing up trillions of more dollars out there, what does it mean? That more and more dollars they print, then the less and less potential value, or certainly real value, is in each individual unit of that currency, in this case the dollar. Right? Because what what comes up? Inflation. Look, if you have your money in a paltry bank earning 1%, what good is that if inflation starts to roar at 6, 10%, maybe higher? Think about this. At at a 10% inflation rate, and that is coming, not if, but when, at a 10% inflation rate, and you're earning barely, you know, uh, half a percent or whatever, you know, in 10 years, roughly, your money will be worthless. It'll cost you a ton of money just to buy a loaf of bread. So in other words, even currencies themselves in a bank account have counterparty risk. So the lesson for you and I, and for financial advisors out there, is that you have to be aware of this and take according uh, steps accordingly to protect yourself in other words don't just diversify across paper assets but diversify outside of paper assets such as things like gold and silver and even tangibles out there believe it or not even things like uh, you know having a nice pantry of uh, canned soups and whatever that'll get you through as well <laughs> more about that another time but anyway i'm glad i had a chance to talk to you about counterparty risk the risks involved and i look forward to talking about more things with you in future videos So I wish you continued success, and don't forget, visit us at ravencapitalist.com about more things that help you, whether it's counterparty risk or anything else out there. Thanks again, and stay tuned for future videos where we'll talk about more personal financial strategies to help you with your finances. This is Paul Majenovic saying thank you, and have a great day.